I was incredibly concerned that there would be a lack of energy and that spark that we all feel when we attend Summit. So I was really disappointed that we weren't able to see each other in Vegas. I was blown away, really blown away at the way that Out and Equal was able to pull off a digital experience of Summit. Welcome to the 2020 Out and Equal Workplace Summit. Seeing so many friends light up the chat box, this is the heartening start I had hoped for today. Out and Equal has meant a lot to me and my family and my wife, um, so I'm thrilled and honored to be here with you. Thank you for doing this with me. I, your wonderful conversation partner. Thank you for the work you do every day to advance workplace equality. The next universal truth can be boiled down to one word, action. You can guarantee good trouble will follow me wherever I go. <laughs> we live in revolutionary times and we need each other in order to get through these moments. You all make up a force to be reckoned with. From Bangalore to Sao Paulo to London to New York, our fates are absolutely inextricably linked. I hope this was as fulfilling and wonderful for you as it was for me. This year, virtually, we gave an experience to a global set of teammates that would have never been able to participate in that equal before. We have the same level of engagement. Our employees felt very, very connected to each one of the plenary sessions, all the workshops. And I have to say that even the offline interaction, it was super nice. I believe that people, because they were attending remotely and they were kind of in their own safe space, that they were able to actually be more open and more transparent. I don't have to feel like I have to be guarded about everything that I say, and I can talk about what I'm truly feeling. Um, and know that I'm accepted. It felt so strong, so it was almost like a healing area for so many months that we were working from home, disconnected from our teams. The technology was absolutely amazing. And the most amazing part to me was seeing all the good mornings, good evenings, good afternoons from all over the world. Knowing that we were part of something that was global and we were part of something that was bringing together participants from all over the world, that was just an amazing feeling. For me. That was an amazing feeling for me. The level of connection, airing super impactful messages about the time that we're having, I think it was super, super inspirational. And so you saw this year, major brands come to the table and have real dialogue, not only about race in America, but the role companies play, and more importantly, the accountability and responsibility we all have as individuals to make sure that it doesn't become a moment and indeed is a movement. Because if everybody feels included, if everybody feels safe, and if everybody feels equal, then the whole team wins. So I just think, say, think about meeting people where they are, creating that sense of belonging. The virtual summit, it was able to keep us all safe and that the business of belonging, the business of inclusion and moving that forward and the advocacy work that we're doing, it didn't end. And we still need to continue to do it in the digital world that we find ourselves in. If there's any silver linings in what 2020 has brought us, it's the fact that we are more connected because platforms like this give us that capability. The work that I can do locally is now inspired by being able to participate in that. That's what made this year's summit so unique. Our work is never canceled. Our drive for inclusion and belonging is never canceled. And our joy found in this vast global network of friends and colleagues is never canceled. Oh my God, it's summit time. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I have to say we played that video for a couple of reasons to get, you know, to get folks into the room, make sure our audio and video are playing, but also to get us psyched. I am feeling really energized, although I did have a pang 
of uh, some feeling when I saw all of those workshops, uh, the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all of those workshops uh, scroll by. So that's what we are going to be talking about in part today is the workshop, uh, the workshops at the Workplace Summit, as well as the um, Audi Awards. So thank you all for joining us uh, on this call today. Really excited to see folks commentary, excited to, to be here, um, seeing Kate in the videos, that's right. I've missed SNL video suggestions. Oh, oh, these SNL video suggestions, yeah. Okay, well, at least it wasn't anything embarrassing I was looking at um, on the uh, YouTube algorithm. So yeah, check out some SNL. But today we're not gonna talk about SNL. We're going to talk about the Workplace Summit, specifically the workshops and Audis, as I mentioned. And we have about an hour. This is a more um, intimate conversation. We really wanted to uh, bring folks in who are going to be doing the bulk of the workshop management for your organizations. Uh, so that's sort of the idea of this call is to really talk through um, a couple of new things that have changed since last year. Uh, now that this is going to be a uh, virtual year number two under our belt, we've learned some great lessons and really excited to implement those in workshops um, and as, as, as well in the Audi's uh, proposal experience. So that's the idea for today. We're just going to talk about some uh, new levels. Thank you, Tristan. Um, it is a gloomy Monday afternoon. We'll talk about these new levels and then let's get to it. I'm really excited to hear everybody's workshop ideas. Um, we have some new opportunities for matchmaking of those workshop ideas. So we will, we will jump right in. Okay, so the very first thing, uh, you're like, who's this person talking at me? Let me introduce myself and my colleagues um, on the line. I'm Isabel Porras. I am the uh, Senior Director for Learning and Development at Out and Equal. So I'm very excited to join all of you. I oversee the educational content for the Workplace Summit. And I'm joined by my colleague, Rebecca York, um, who some of you may have met at last year's Workplace Summit and or may have met through their work uh, facilitating our learning and development offerings. So Rebecca's gonna get on in just a little bit and talk a little bit more about the workshops, but I wanted to make sure to call her out now as um, some of your questions may be going to Rebecca as well as me. So that just means you have two people now to answer any of your workshop related questions. More to go around. Um, along with Rebecca, I'm joined by my colleague Noam Shalef, who is our Director of Communications and who is overseeing all things Audi Awards, along with Madeline Peru, our manager in communications. So the four of us are just gonna be talking at you for this hour, but we will have time for a question and, and a Q and A, question and answer period. So before we get into all of that, I'm going to ask that you whip out your phone or your tablet or a new uh, browser window in your computer, but I prefer phone or tablet, so you, you can kind of just look at both, but it'll work. Uh, whichever you do, if you opened your phone, please go ahead and just kind of hover over with your camera over Menti and it'll open up the QR code, or we can go old school and actually open the browser and type in www.menti.com and use the code 24096004. Uh, so thank you, Rebecca, for chatting that in. So I'm, I'm, once you do that, if you can double tap the heart, uh, then I'll be able to see that we have a good group of people kind of going in there. Ooh, excellent. So this is really easy. And um, with the mentee kind of doing a two for one, uh, this is an opportunity for us to know a little bit about you, but I also wanted to showcase mentee. There's lots of other options. We, we, we don't have any sort of special relationship with Mentimeter. We just happen to like using them. There's lots of other similar uh, webinar engagement type programs. So keep in mind, this is a webinar. We're not able to um, see you or unmute you, but we still wanna be able to have some interaction that, that goes beyond the chat. So just kind of letting that uh, percolate um, as you think about what your sessions might look like at Summit this year. All right, so I see a lot of folks are in there. You can still have some time. It'll be in the chat and the code will be at the top of all the slides that, that use Mentimeter if you um, aren't able to join yet. But I wanna go ahead and just ask a quick multiple choice question, uh, not very complicated, just to get a sense of who is in the webinar room, so to speak. Have you submitted a workshop in the past, the summit workshop, and if so, have you presented um, or not yet? 
exciting. So I see a lot of not yet in the call, which is great um, for the 10 of you who said yes, and I've presented some of this will be similar, uh, uh, familiar information. But for those 24 of you who haven't presented yet, hopefully this will be new and exciting. And a couple of folks who have submitted but have not yet had a chance to present, we'll talk a little bit more about some strategies to revisit proposals uh, to help uh, help them maybe rank a, a little bit higher in the uh, review process. So very excited for that. I also see two questions here. So I just want to flag this for folks quickly. Um, we will, perfect. So I see one, not yet. I'll just mark that as answered, submitted, but never presented. You'll see that Q&A option. So any questions that you have throughout the um, the uh, webinar today, go ahead and chat those in through that Q&A and we're gonna get back to them at the end of the call. The good thing with the Q&A also is that you can upvote other folks' questions. So if somebody already asked about deadlines, you don't need to resubmit, you can just upvote their question and, and it'll move it up in the queue. So great, a number of you have presented, uh, the vast majority of you have not yet presented. So this will be new information. And you know the, the short answer of it is, we really want to help you succeed. So a lot of this is about tools and tricks and processes that you can do uh, to strengthen your proposal. So you are on the right call. All right, so the very important thing, this is probably the uh, take some screenshots um, slide is going to be the important deadlines for this year. The uh, online proposal uh, portal has opened as of 11 minutes ago. It opened right at noon Pacific time. So you can start submitting workshop proposals today. But don't submit workshop proposals today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna be a little uh, uh, wary if something is submitted right away because that means you know you probably haven't had a chance to sort of digest some of the information that we're going through today. So it's opening today, but I, I, I imagine that it'll take folks a little bit of time to get into the portal, and we'll also have some time for office hours. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But you can start submitting to today, and you are able to submit proposals through July 9th. That's the deadline um, for submitting any workshop proposals, July 9th. Please, I recognize that a number of you at your organizations have an internal deadline. If you already know, just right off the bat, you know, oops, we made our internal deadline July 9th, let me know and let's let's work through that. Um, earlier communication is always better. So um, just please letting me know ahead of time, but otherwise, Try to shoot for July 9th to be the deadline when everything is submitted to us. So if you are putting together internal deadlines for folks to submit um, all of their workshops to you first, and then organizationally you submit them to Out and Equal, that's fine. Make sure that you have that deadline before July 9th, because we want to make sure that everything is in there. For a quick turnaround, we hope to sub, um, notify everybody of acceptances and, and um, rejections, unfortunately, by July 30th. So by the end of July, we want to have the workshop slate uh, selected. And we'll really need your help in that by making sure that your submissions are um, in on time and that you communicate to your organization if they need to go through you first. After that, we will um, please ask that you hold September 7th uh, for a workshop presenter town call. Um, that will be most likely at, at noon Pacific as well, so 3 p.m. Eastern. And that'll be recorded as is this call for any workshop presenters to sort of get an overview of the platform, some best practices for their presentation, et cetera. But those are the key deadlines. The most important for you all being July 9th. Workshops must be submitted by then. A little bit about the commitments, and I'm walking through the call for proposal. So this PDF document is available on our website. Um, I believe you you got it when you registered for this. It was it was attached to the invite. Um, and if not, you're able to go on outandequal.org and find the call for proposals there. So I'm not going to read through it in, in, in close detail, but just wanted to call out our education commitments have not changed. The the I think one of the real values of the Workplace Summit, as opposed to um, other kind of conferences looking at LGBTQ inclusion or DEI inclusion more broadly, is that Workplace Summit is really centering peer-to-peer -peer education. So Workplace Summit is where you learn best practices from folks who are 
in the trenches with you. Um, there is some opportunity for sessions that, that may be a little bit more general or sessions that are led by external subject matter experts, but the bulk of our content and, and, and the value of the summit comes from that learning peer to peer. Um, so that is definitely uh, still a commitment moving forward this year. Of course, our focus on diversity and intersectionality has only increased. Um, so we are definitely looking for uh, uh, workshops that speak to LGBTQ workplace inclusion but from an intersectional and diverse framework and lens. Um, so not just in terms of diversity of, uh, of speakers, but also diversity of thought and frameworks as you consider your proposal. Are you taking into account the fact that the LGBTQ community is not a monolith, right? How does this program intersect with some of your other resource groups, for example. So those are the kinds of questions that, that we really wanna look at. And again, as I mentioned, the focus is really on LGBTQ workplace equality. There's some opportunity for sort of more general sessions, but really that focus is on LGBTQ workplace equality and on furthering belonging for all of us. So workshops that are about those topics uh, will have a much better chance of being accepted. Rebecca, um, I believe that you are going to share a little bit more about the workshop uh, types, but before you do that, I just want to call out for people, we are using proposal space again. So those of you who submitted workshops last year, or the year before, or the year before that, or the year before that, or the year before that, I believe all the way through um, uh, the early 2010s, we are still using proposal space. It's, um, you know, the Spanish saying, bueno, bonito, barato, it works. Like it just works nicely for us. All of our partners, um, many of you have already created accounts over the years. Um, so no need to reinvent the wheel. We're going to stick with proposal space this year, both for the workshops as well as the Audis. And we'll talk about that in a second. Proposal space is very easy to use, free to create your account. Your accounts um, from, from years past should still be valid. Your workshops must be submitted through proposal space. So again, I recognize that there are some organizations that have an internal review process first, and you may have people submitting via internal forms or Word documents or what have you. All of that is fine. Before workshops to be considered by us and to be submitted to us, they must be submitted through this portal. Uh, we cannot take email submissions or things like that. It gets very, uh, very unwieldy. And, and I want to make sure that no workshop uh, falls through the cracks. So please, please submit via proposal space. Um, again, if you already have an account, it'll be easy. If you don't, it'll take you five minutes. It's, it's not very complicated. I do recommend that you collect all the information before you begin. This is a best practice with anything, honestly, that, that requires you submit forms online. You never know if the website is gonna glitch or your browser crashes. So best practice, not just for this, but really anything, um, open a new uh, text uh, document, a word, word processing file and uh, copy your information there and then paste it into the proposal space. Um, that way, again, if you have any issues, you have that document saved. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about demographic information when we get to speakers, but that's really it when it comes to the proposal space. Not very complicated, uh, very easy to understand, um, and you'll just need to, to sort of paste everything in there. Now, when it comes to the content for the proposal, it has shifted slightly from years past um, because we are virtual again this year. We wanted to add a little bit more detail about the different types of sessions that you can use. But before we talk about those sessions, I just want to call out a couple of things. Um, the Really about the difference with the proposal. Half of what you're submitting in the proposal is going to be public. The other half is really just for the review. And I, I want to make clear and, and suggest to folks um, to really think about that public half a little bit differently. What do I mean by that? Your session title and your brief session abstract are your commitment to attendees at Summit, right? When I'm scrolling through the, the platform and I see the workshop titles, that's how I'm picking a session. And so your, your workshop title should be concise. It can be catchy. I think we may have exhausted the buy puns, but maybe not. You will let us know, uh, right? So a pun is always welcome. But beyond that, make sure that your title actually reflects what you're going to be talking about. I do think about some workshops that have had critical feedback in the past where maybe the workshop title is, you know, I don't know, 
uh, leveraging self ID for global inclusion. And then when you get in there, folks are talking about ERG programming, right? Like that's an extreme example, but your title is really your commitment to what it is that you're going to talk about. So make sure it reflects your actual topic. Even if it can't, you know, be punny and quirky and cute, it's better for it to be um, actually reflective of what you're going to be talking about. Same thing with the brief session abstract. That's the public facing document. So you are competing with a number of other workshops, right, in the same track for attendees. So your session abstract should make it clear, like come to my session because this is who you're going to hear and this is what you're going to get out of it. I think sometimes folks add more of that information in the expanded proposal, but keep in mind the expanded proposal is just for the review committees, right? That's a little bit more detail. Make sure that the key parts of that are also articulated in the session abstract. So that's that's one more thing that I would call out from this. Other than that, you know, the, the providing of an expanded proposal, specifying takeaways, those things are going to be relatively uh, straightforward. I'll turn it over to Rebecca now. Okay. Hello, everyone. We'll take a little pause after all of that info. Um, we really want to know what topics you were excited to learn more about at Summit this year. What topics do you want to learn more about? And we'll just wait a bit for your answers to come in. I think I did do this correctly, I hope. So you can submit some words. It should be a word cloud. You don't need to submit all three. Okay, we got things coming in. Self ID, policy, intersectionality, post pandemic jobs. Our theme is future of work. So that's very, very apt. Allyship, hiring, how to be a strong ERG, equity, mental health, job search, belonging, personal growth, Trans best practices, gender fluidity, advocating for trans identities, Asexual. white supremacy, right. COVID and STI testing. I'd love a session on that. I don't know about you, Isabel, but that sounds I awesome. That next topics. Great. Everybody, yeah. we know exactly who submitted what. You are now committed. No, I'm just kidding. These are anonymous. <laughs> That's the other benefit of Mentimeters. They're completely anonymous, but. I hope everybody's taking a minute to read through it, get some I, ideas. <laughs> I saw a Q&A come into Zoom uh, asking if this will be recorded and shared. It will, is my it understanding. Is being yes. So yes, so you'll have a record of all of these great session ideas to, to just take back to your team, see how they feel. Uh, but we're, we're really excited for this. So thank you all. You can keep sending things in, I believe, even after we flip away. So just keep brainstorming with each other. <laughs> Okay, so the areas of focus, really these haven't changed from last year. You should, if you submitted last year, these should seem pretty familiar. Um, something that I really wanna make sure you all understand is that these area of, areas of focus are not the tracks. These are not the learning tracks that we saw on the Pathable site last year with the fun little tags. Um, these are really for us and the review committees to understand what we're going to tag these as. So this is kind of the front end where you're saying, again, to Isabel's point, this is what we're covering. This is what we're going to be touching on. And then once we see the proposal, et cetera, we'll place you from there. Um, but I do want to call out, you mentioned wanting to talk about gender expansive, non-binary identities. That's one of the tracks. We've got transgender identities as one of the tracks. Um, We've got, uh, do we see, yeah, law and public policy. So see all of those things that you were pulling out in the previous slide, you can pretty neatly sort them into these things and then you can cross list your areas of focus and say, we're gonna talk about policy. We're also gonna focus on gender expansive identities or what have you. Yeah, perfect. Um, so again, uh, really wanna highlight that um, we're breaking up some of the session formats this year. Uh, we are not going quite with the same uh, 
style, is that the right word, of, of our sessions in the past, we're expanding a little bit. We're going to have panel discussions. We're going to have presentations, roundtables, talks, and workshops. And we've broken each of these things down. Really, the goal behind this is so that we can make the best use of our virtual time that we can. We're all Zoom fatigued. Um, we're all sort of in the flow, and, and time is tight virtually. We want to make sure that the time people have together live in a Zoom room is spent well, so that they're getting the interaction that they want, that they're getting to, to talk with one another about best practices or talk directly with an expert. So there are going to be times when we could pre-record content instead of having it live, things like that. Um, and, and yeah, go back through, it'll, it'll make sense, sorry. So in terms of uh, submitting, I also want to call out, thank you Isabel for going back here, um, that we have different audience levels. So this goes back to Isabel's idea of like you're making a commitment with the abstract that's externally facing and the title that's externally facing. Um, keep that in mind when you're figuring out what content to actually cover in the session. If you're going to be talking about um, policy and it's you're really speaking to the folks who work in legal or HR, don't mark it as general because then you're going to have someone from an ERG coming in and not having the backstory. So really be mindful with how you're you're labeling your sessions and really once you label it, make sure that you're circling back and saying, okay, would a random ERG member who's just showing up to learn more be able to understand where we're coming from or, or whatever the demographic is that you're working with? Thank you for that, Rebecca. I, I will also call out for folks, um, you know, there's there's a, a good mix of, of attendees at Summit, and so you really should consider across all of these. Introductory and intermediate, I think, make a lot of sense, especially when there are clean best practices, like a nice, you know, shaped up case study of we tried this thing and here's how it went, you know, here's what we learned. Those are great. But a lot of times I think folks hold back sometimes, and I know this from the office hours or years past, of submitting a workshop, either one, because they think it's too niche, and I think that's where the advanced um, space really comes in, the audience level, or because it's not fully defined. There's no solution yet. A lot of folks are like, I would love to have a workshop on self-ID to keep using that example, but we haven't successfully launched our self-ID initiative because we're still struggling with getting buy-in. Well, I say, you know, we welcome uh, workshops, panels, uh, you know, uh, uh, webinars, etc. on how to successfully launch a self-ID program. But we also welcome a roundtable discussion on, you know, getting executive buy-in, right? Coming in and saying, we are struggling with this issue. And we want to talk to others who maybe have, have worked on this issue and have a resolution or who are struggling just like us. I, I bring this up to say, a lot of times I think folks think, I'm going to summit, I have to have a fully organized um, uh, sort of, you know, put a bow on the package, uh, you know, proposal, and, and those are welcome. But a lot of times, and I think as attendees, we also want to participate and be in the room with something that I might have a chance of, of working through with you. So to Rebecca's point, this year, it's virtual again, we've had a year plus of Zoom and Microsoft Teams and WebEx and everything under our belts. So let's make sure that the time that we are together during the summit is spent networking and interacting. If you have um, a lecture component to your presentation, consider pre-recording that and making it a hybrid session. Um, so one of the things that we learned last year is really how to better uh, facilitate those hybrid sessions. So that's something that we're incorporating into the proposal this year. We're asking you to think about the session format, which are the ones that Rebecca um, talked about now, right? Will your session be a panel? Will it be a workshop? Will it be a presentation? And we're also asking you to consider the style. Is it a pre-recorded video? I'm sorry, is it a pre-recorded video? Is it a live video meeting? Is it a hybrid pre-record with a live video meeting? Is it a live webinar, right? And again, on proposal space, all of those options are broken down and explained. There's a little orange button, orange question mark that you'll click and it'll explain all of those. This is so that as you're thinking through your proposal, you can keep in mind what are some of the best uh, practices for each type of session. I'll also flag here that again, we are with the same platform that we used last year, Pathable. 
which is very successful, Pathable does require that presenters, not attendees, but that presenters download the Zoom desktop client. So if you already know that there is some limitation and you are not able to use personal technology or something else, keep that in mind because that will limit the type of session that you can facilitate. It'll really limit you to um, a, a uh, pre-recorded content only. So again, you can, you can email us with any of those types of questions, but just flagging for folks ahead of time before you start the process. Um, I want to be mindful of time and make sure that we have time for questions. So before we turn it over to our comms colleagues or communications colleagues to talk a little bit about Audis, I just want to flag the last part of the proposal. So you're submitting the proposal content. This is our topic. This is what we're going to talk about. The second half of your proposal is who's doing the talking, right? Who are you bringing to the to the um, to that session? So again, we are asking that you submit your presenter info. Please, please keep in mind diversity of presenters, diversity of presenters in terms of identities, but also in terms of seniorities, in terms of locations, right? So when you think about who are the folks that we invite to summit from your organization, who you bring to summit, um, is it the same group of people year after year? Are you expanding your speaking opportunities, right? Or is it, you know, the same kind of two or three people always will do that presentation? Can you consider bringing in some more junior folks, right, to, to, to ex expand in that? Are there other voices, um, junior or senior, right, who, who may know that framework as well? So really encourage you to think about who you're giving the microphone to, right, in terms of that workshop submission, and that you share their demographic information with us. Um, so that demographic information is decoupled from the workshop proposal, but helps us ensure when we do our review at the end that we have a broad slate of perspectives um, reflected. So again, we do take workshops from individual participants. So if you're on this line and you're actually keeps talking about partners and, and I'm just submitting by myself, absolutely, that is welcome. But a number of you from our partner organizations are really managing a, a bigger workshop slate or a bigger cohort of summit attendees. So really asking you to think through who you invite and who you hand that microphone to. We wanna make sure that we have a, a, we're reflecting a variety of experiences within our community. Beyond sharing the information as to who's speaking, we're also asking you to share the primary contact information. Sometimes that's one of the speakers, but not always. Again, for a number of you, it's gonna be that one person across the organization who's the point of contact. Um, please, please make sure that that person knows that they're the primary contact and that they are on the lookout for emails from us because the notifications will go to them, not the speakers. So please make sure that that primary contact knows that they're the primary contact, has consented to being the primary contact, and is able to check their email and circulate um, information from us to your speakers. I'll pause here to sort of wrap it up. Uh, I've seen a couple of questions about this. This slide deck is coming from our call for proposals uh, sort of PDF. Um, so this is available online, the exact same information we've talked about here, including some of these tips for a successful proposal, which we've already talked about. So I'll just call out a couple. Primarily, making sure that there are takeaways. I can't tell you how difficult it is to read a workshop title and abstract and you're like, yes, this sounds great, hot topic. And then when you read through the abstract, you're like, well, what are we gonna do there, right? Are we just like talking about this topic? Are you telling me things that worked? Are we discussing together some challenges? Like, what are we doing? So making that very clear, not just we're gonna talk about self-ID, but what about it? That's an important component. Keep in mind engagement, right? So if your session is, if you're, you're asking for it to be a live video meeting, are you making use of breakout rooms? Are you having people unmute themselves? If it's a webinar like this, are you using some kind of polling software? Are you pausing for questions in the middle? Like what are you doing to keep people engaged? Because if you don't need engagement, let's pre-record that, right? Let's have that content available on demand. That'll really, um, that, that'll, I think, really be more positive for everybody. I've mentioned including diverse voices, presenting new workshops, always welcome. Although if you have some tried and true best practices, 
you know, making clear to us this, you know, this is a, a, a workshop that we originally presented in 2017. Here's what's new, right? Like here's the, here's what we're bringing back. If it's the exact same proposal, what's the value? What's the difference here? Um, so that that is pretty much it when it comes to workshops. A couple of things that I'll flag here is you'll see um, emails coming from us in the coming days with information about office hours. So uh, that that's coming back. We've had that a couple of years ago. Rebecca and I will have office hours, so you can just schedule. We'll, we'll share the the calendar times with everybody on this call and others. Um, you'll be able to just kind of drop in for quick fifteen minute questions of you know. We have this topic, is it a panel, is it a workshop, is it a meeting, is it a webinar? That's, you know, come to us. And Rebecca, do you wanna talk a little bit about our matchmaking? And we'll share some more details about that via email as well. Yes, we are really excited that this year we're gonna be leveraging the Global Hub, the community message boards on the platform to help you all connect with other partners who might have case studies, who might have panelists, who could speak to a certain topic or idea. So if you go onto the Global Hub, which, which our partners do have access to, and you'll click on the community tab that you'll see, you'll see a list of channels. There will be one at the top that says 2021 Workplace Summit. Go there. There you'll find a, a post that says, read this channel guidelines. That will show you exactly how to make the most of that channel and say, hey, I'm looking for a panelist who can speak on the intersection of indigenous, indigeneity and trans identity um, on for this panel that we're gonna talk about X, Y, Z. Do you know anyone? And then you all can be saying, oh, I actually have a perfect person in mind. Go here, let's connect. You can build that out. Case studies, resources. You can ask folks for resources and they'll say, oh, we put something on the hub a few weeks ago. Here's the link. You know, So really we want this to be a place where you all can flesh out your ideas together, getting input, sharing ideas, finding partners to work with. Um, so we're really excited about that. And yes, we will share more info how to log on, all that jazz in a bit. We are pumped uh, because a lot of times those conversations have to flow via email and they get stretched out, right? So I get an email from someone who's like, hey, we want to do a workshop on ally programs, but we don't want it to be just us, which is a great uh idea, right? We really want to replicate. It's not just a company um, sort of commercial. We really want to talk to other people. Do you know anybody? And then I have to think, yes, I know this person. Now I got to email that person. Hey, can you connect? So the idea is this way, it'll be a lot faster and more direct. You're still welcome to, you know, email for suggestions, but this way you'll sort of get to the heart of it right away. Um, so we are very, very excited about that for folks. Um, all right. Well, with that, please submit your questions about uh, summit, um, about the summit workshops. We'll get to those in a few minutes. Um, one last thing I'll say on the summit is to please uh, help us circulate this call for proposals. It's open, excuse me, it's open to the public globally, right, as a virtual event. So please forward this to maybe other stakeholders who you know at your organization or in your networks, other resource groups who may have some information and best practices to share with us. Uh, if you have ideas for speakers or if you yourself are like, I would love to join a panel on X, join on the Global Hub and share that. Um, so we're really asking for folks to suggest ideas and speakers to each other and encourage you to organize some training opportunities at your company, particularly those of you who manage large groups of workshop slates internally. Consider how this might be a learning opportunity, a development opportunity um, for some of your other constituents as well. So with that, I am just giddy to start getting those proposals um, ready and start reading through everybody's best practices, but not yet. Before we do that, we've got to talk about Audis. So I'm going to turn it over to Noah. And Noah, I'm in true fashion, you're still muted. Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I am very, very excited to talk about Audis and sort of uh, love following Isabel and sort of the energy uh, that she brings. Uh, we have been doing the Audis for 20 years already. Um, uh, it is an award with uh, that legacy of all of the incredible leaders uh, and the organizations that we've been able to support over the years. 
uh, to recognize them, to recognize people who are part of the extended out equal family for what they've been doing for, um, excuse me, for workplace equality. Uh, when we are able to meet in person, the Audis are awarded as an award show as a part of the gala at the end of summit. Um, last year, when we had to be virtual, we produced an award show and we uh, did it in segments that played uh, at every plenary that we did. Uh, we're still figuring out the exact timing, but we're likely to do something similar to that this year. Um, those videos, uh, the videos of those award segments were enormously popular. They kind of went on like wild, wildfire on social media, uh, people sort of seeing who it was that won what award, um, some of the, the acceptance speech and that sort of conversation about uh, what it is that these folks were doing um, that merited that. Uh, we do the Audis uh, in order to recognize individuals and organizations that are leading the way. Uh, folks who are innovating to build cultures of belonging for the LGBTQ community and everybody else. Uh, we do that, we know that recognition is deserved. Uh, we know that when we provide that recognition, it can create even more positive change in the organization that's being honored or uh, in the organization where the individual is being honored. Um, and we also know that it can create a benchmark um, and encouragement for other organizations uh, to pay attention and set new goals and figure out how they can uh, do more and do better. And that's why we do the Audis. Uh, our process, uh, we'll go into the timelines later on, but sort of very broadly speaking, we are opening up nominations. Uh, the portal will be open by tomorrow. Um, we will accept nominations until July 9th at the same date um, as the uh, workshop deadline. Um, and then we will have an external review committee go through uh, uh, the nominations and, and review them, score them, comment on them. And that is the basis upon which Audis are awarded. Um, so that's a get big overview. Let's start talking about what Audi Awards we're gonna do this year. Um, we have a number of Audi Awards that are returning. I'm not gonna read them all um, word for word, but I just you know, wanna point out in my memory of these, you know, some of these awards, um, when I'm remembering Dow winning Workplace Excellence last year, um, I remember the, the comment, the review in the committee, the, the way that um, it was really clear that Dow's commitment to LGBTQ inclusion uh, was in every, infused into every aspect of the organization at, at every level of management um, in the United States and globally. Um, and they, they really told that story uh, in the nomination that went in and so they did that very, very compellingly. Um, I remember HP, I'm not gonna do this for everyone, but you know, HP and it's ERG, it's actually ERG and the, the way that they were really innovating and, and getting results that they were able to talk about in terms of how they work together with, with marketing folks, with the legal teams um, to create real and, and meaningful change. Uh, I said, I'm not gonna do it for all of these. These are the other uh, Audi Awards that we had last year that are returning again this year. Um, JP Morgan Chase Poland, the work that they were doing to you know, upstart ERG that was getting in all these uh, members, I, I don't remember what the percentage was, but a big part of the, of the representation of the organization in that country in a context when where uh, the politics are, are pulling in a very, very other direction. Um, with that, yes, let's keep going. Um, new Audi Awards in 2021, drum roll please. Um, these are Audi Awards that we have never had before. Um, and we are very, very, very excited about them. And we put a lot of thought into what do we really want to elevate in 2021 and have people talking about and recognize the work that is going on in, again, this community of change makers uh, across organizations. Um, so uh, I'm not gonna, Again, read these verbatim, but you know the, that Belonging and Equity Visionary Award is about an organization that is creating connection, collaboration, allyship across boundaries of cultures and race. Um, I think it's there's a lot of innovation that is happening on this issue, and and we want to talk about it and we want to elevate it. Um, the other new Audi Award for 2021. Um, 
this is our global LGBTQ corporate advocate, um, out an equal global organization. We are uh, particularly focused on work in Brazil, the rest of Latin America, China, and India. Um, and we want a great space to uh, recognize some of the change makers who are active in those areas. Um, and we created this Audi for that purpose. So with that overview, um, I have a, a mentee question, uh, which is, which Audi award are you most excited about for this year? Um, and uh, I know which ones I am, but I'm interested to hear your, uh, or excited to hear your response to that. Um, and as we as those come in, I'm going to introduce Metal Peru, who's going to go over sort of more of the details um, and some suggestions and tips for how to uh, be most effective in your nominations. Hi, everyone. I am Madeline. I'm the communications manager. I use she, her pronouns. We're going to go through a few key dates and the process for this year's Audi Awards. So important deadlines, as Isabel said, this is the screenshot page. We will also be following up with emails. You'll hear from us way more than you want to about these deadlines. So no need if you um, don't get this down today, don't worry, we will be in touch. So the nominations open this week. Uh, you'll get an email from us with links to submit your nominations. The nominations will close on July 9th, and we will notify the honorees on the week of August 9th. The process many of you are familiar with or have been on our committees in the past. We will have a review committee that will review all of the submissions, and the honorees will be featured at this year's summit um, on social media, on our website, and we will have plenty of assets for you all to share internally and externally on your own. Go to the next slide. So we're going to share a few secrets to success and I'm going to go through some of these quickly because again we'll be in touch with all of these tips and we'll have more opportunities to connect with you all. We know that so many of you have incredible stories to share and pe people you want to lift up, ERGs that you want to celebrate. So we hope that this is the year that all of your hard work is recognized on this year's Audi Awards. So we wanna help make that possible by giving you some tips and secrets to success to keep in mind when completing your submissions. Our team is also available throughout the process to answer any questions, to listen to your stories, to give feedback as you submit these applications, because we really do want you all to have the recognition that you deserve. So the first is share impactful stories. When crafting a nomination, it's important to focus on storytelling. What are the real life stories that have happened as a result of your ERG's work? your company's policy, the individual's bravery? What are the true stories that have happened that you can share with us that'll cause your, or will make your submission just blossom even more? Focus on the stories of authenticity, of resiliency, and the ones that have a huge impact when you're working on your submission. The next is to provide some metrics. So use numbers, data, metrics. They're all helpful parts of an Audi submission because they help support the stories that you're telling. It's important to use the numbers as support for your stories and not in place of, because we really do wanna focus on those impactful stories that you're sharing, but metrics can help stand out to the review committee. Uh, next, we want to encourage you all to keep your nominations short and sweet. The most powerful submissions that we've seen in the past, the people are able to, or the nominators are able to tell a story that is concise and is able to grab the people reviewing the applications or the nominations attention quickly. So think twice when you're reviewing your submission on the context and background information that you're including and think about what's really important to the story and what might, might not be necessary to the overall narrative. Another secret to success is prioritizing diversity and intersectionality. This is something that Isabel touched on with workshop proposals and it is true for the Audi Awards as well. When nominating an organization, an ERG, or an individual, focus on the stories and the work that continue to create and advance opportunities for underrepresented communities, um, both in the workplace and beyond. 
as the nominator, you are in control of the people and the stories that you uplift. Just remember that as you're going through your process, you are able to control the narrative of the Audi Awards this year by what you submit and the stories you tell. So it's important to highlight diversity and intersectionality in those nominations. Next, we have a new feature this year. For some of you that might be familiar with the process, you'll notice when you go to your proposal space this year that we have the opportunity for you to submit some video testimony this year. So we will have a place for you to submit links to a video testimony to focus on anything that supports the nomination and the stories you've told. And it helps give the stories a little bit of extra life when we can watch a video of you or whoever in your ERG organization speaking to the work that you all have done over the past year. Uh, but this is optional. So if you're thinking of this now and are stressed about the video, don't worry about it. It's optional, but we do encourage you to try it out um, since it is new this year. And last, we have another new feature this year is having um, or including a statement of support from your ERG's executive sponsor. This is also an optional feature for this year, and um, but we do encourage it because it is nice to see when the application is strengthened by broader organizational support or clear support from your leadership. So you'll have a place to upload a PDF of the statement from the executive sponsor, short and sweet about why they support this nomination and just a brief commentary about um, what you're submitting. Uh, with that, I will almost wrap it up. We have um, office hours this year. This is another new thing we are doing because again, we do want to help you all through the process and help pull the best stories from you all in the uh, Audi submission process this year. So we will have office hours to help answer questions, to help guide stories, to be a listening wall for you all uh, before your submission. So you'll see on the screen, we have three times listed. Don't worry about jotting these down. We will send them out tomorrow to you all into our broader list of people. We um, want to have you all just drop in. So no need to email us with appointments. Our staff will be here to help answer your questions. And we will also send those registration links tomorrow. So next slide. Okay, so we're gonna do a final um, poll, I guess for lack of a better word. We wanna hear from you. What are your own secrets to success for creating and sharing powerful and impactful stories? So whether this is in your personal life, professional life, or even in a previous Audi submission, if we have any winners in this group or people who have been honored in the past, we would love to hear your secrets to success, um, Audis or not Audis. What do you keep in mind when you're telling powerful stories? Um, and how? what advice do you have for the other folks on the call today for when they're thinking of these stories that they wanna tell? So we'll wait for some of those to come in on Mentimeter. And also please keep submitting your questions. I ran through that quickly. We will be in touch with follow-up information. So don't worry if you missed anything, keep it short and sweet. Thank you for that validation of my secret to success. <laughs> be honest and add humor, being relatable, including quotes from people, authentic brief statements, personal, sharing from own experience, keep it real, connect to real people and tangible things, keep it organized. These are all really great tips um, and secrets to telling a great story and are things that we've, we've included in our list or we'll make sure that we include to our communications when we're helping people uh, throughout the process. So continue submitting these. I'm gonna turn it back to Isabel to go through, um, Oh wait, maybe I lied that this wasn't the last question on Mentimeter and Isabel actually had another one, but. No, no, this is, yeah, this is for, for questions. So, so thank you for that. And I think folks should still be able to submit um, some of those tips. When we send out the information uh, tomorrow with those office hours and everything, I'll include those screenshots of folks' responses so those tips can live on with the rest of us. But moving on to questions now, I see one, can you elaborate on what you're looking for or topics when it comes to the talent acquisition track? I will say, since we're amongst friends on this call, 
talent acquisition track has historically been one of the more difficult ones. Um, I think this is one where maybe folks feel like they have to have something fully shaped up. So to answer this question, I would say anything broadly speaking in talent and acquisition related to LGBTQ recruitment will be very interested in intersectional recruiting. Um, you know, how are you looking at at uh, Gen Z and you know gender identity and sexuality, but also I think talent acquisition is one particular track that would very much benefit from some of those working groups that I was talking about earlier, from bringing a problem or a challenge you're currently grappling with. I really want to call out the roundtable framework, which I think a lot of times is one of these underutilized in the proposal process. I don't know why that is. I think sometimes folks are like, it doesn't feel as substantive, but that's, that's only bad roundtables. Good roundtables do have that substance, do have that sort of grounding element and do share some best practices, but are more about opening up, building connection and working through pro, uh, problems together. So to answer this question, I would say anything broadly related to talent acquisition is welcome under consideration. But what I think will be very successful are either things that are looking at specifically recruitment of LGBTQ individuals, retention of LGBTQ leaders, and broadly questions around challenges that you have as opposed to bringing up, you know, a kind of neatly wrapped up case study. Those are welcome, but talent acquisition is one where you can bring a lot of that grappling because I think that's, that's um, something that folks are, are asking for. So thank you for that. Um, let's see. What time frame should the awards be based on? Noam and Madeline, I believe this is about Audis. Are we looking at all of 2020? Are you looking beyond? Yeah, I'll uh, answer that. Generally, we're talking about the last year. So, uh, you know, the Audis are awarded in October. We're, you know, think of it uh, broadly as October to October or, or the last year, maybe a year and a half, because, right, these nominations are being submitted now. So, right, you, you need that, that time frame. Uh, pay attention to how the Audis are described in the, you know, short paragraph um, about each Audi. Some of them also talk about you know, this organization has a history of, of doing A, B, or C. Um, in those cases, that's a hint that we're, that there is room to, uh, and we're going to be looking at the larger context. Um, uh, so that's the exception to the last, you know, year, year and a half. Yes, thank you for that. Could we partner with an organization that is not a conference attendee to present a workshop or do all presenters need to be registered attendees? What an excellent question. So let me answer, let me answer by breaking down. First question, can we partner with an organization that is not a conference attendee? I definitely think you can partner with external organizations. Um, I'm thinking of some workshops, there were a lot of workshops, so don't judge me for not remembering all over 200, but I distinctly remember um, a couple of workshops that some, some of our partners did last year, bringing some of their, their um, community partners. So there were some with some folks working through San Diego Pride. Um, you know, historically, the corporate community partnership track is only two or three years old, I believe. Now I need to like go into my summit history. And it's due to folks submitting more workshops. Here's us, you know, here's how our ERG partnered with the local, you know, uh, uh, Trevor project, or here's how we uh, worked with the local community um, LGBTQ food bank. Those are excellent workshops. I, I really think that there's a value in looking at not just how our organizations um, connect at, at sort of the corporate or multinational levels, but on the local community level as well. So yes, absolutely. If you have something of relevance that is working with a public health department, I absolutely encourage you to submit that. Now to the second half of the question about conference attendees. We do have uh, uh, registration rates for nonprofit attendees. So I, I do want to flag that. And I also want to flag for our corporate partners. If you are inviting somebody to join you for a workshop, I definitely encourage you to um, offer to cover their registration as well. I have been in a in numbers of my colleagues here have been invited to conferences by you all to join you in other sessions. And that has meant a lot to me to be able to register for the panel, you know, have access to the rest of the conference and, and to be sort of supported in that way because I'm, I'm speaking on a panel, right? So if you're inviting somebody, 
to do this labor for you, I definitely would encourage your company to cover their registration so that they can participate and get best practices throughout. We do have some limited nuance uh, where, where there might be an issue, especially if it's, you know, we have, you know, the the CEO of the public health department cannot join summit. They are literally zooming in for the for the 30 minutes to speak on this panel and then departing. I think those with some nuance we can work through, but by and large, we do ask that everybody who is presenting at the conference be registered for the conference. Did you just want to flag that? But that should not uh, limit you from interacting with others. Please email if you have any questions. Does a transgender or veteran speaker carry more weight than gay or lesbian? We are not looking at speakers in that way, nor ranking folks' identity practices. As I mentioned, they're, they're sort of decoupled. So we're not going through the workshop proposal and then, you know, on the other half, have the speaker demographics open. That we just don't have that framework. Like that's not how this works. We will go through the content first, make decisions, right? Make rankings of, of workshops. Then as we look at our selected slate, we look at the demographic information of who's there. But we're not saying this workshop has a trans speaker, this workshop has a gay speaker, we're going for that. This is, this is not how it's broken down. So no, the speakers don't carry weight depending on their identities, but we do wish to reflect uh, diversity of experiences. And actually I will take it back and say there is weight when it comes to speaking about the identity practices. So we have had to reject a number of workshops in the past that speak about trans experiences with no trans voices on the panel. That is going to be a different workshop than, hey, here's a panel of cis people talking about trans allyship or talking about the policies and benefits that we've put in place to support our trans and non-binary colleagues you know, at organization X. But here's a bunch of cis people to talk to you about trans experiences. In that instance, I would say, yes, the identities of the topic, right? The speakers who share that identity are going to be way differently than talking about a group of folks. Same thing, a group of, of, of white speakers talking about POC experiences is not quite there a group of white speakers speaking about dismantling white supremacy or unpacking white privilege is very appropriate, right? So the idea isn't that folks can't speak across topics, but be mindful of when you're talking around allyship, when you're talking about you know, policies and practices, and when you're talking about identities, personal identities and experiences. And anything that has to do with people, I, people's identity experiences should be articulated by folks who have that identity. So in that sense, that is where that weighing um, would take place. Wow, this is a really exciting thing. This is my favorite part about Mentimeter. You can upvote and then you can, we still have, no, nope, we don't have any minutes. We're past two minutes. So I think we've answered all the questions, but um, Rebecca, if you wouldn't mind, cause I'm on the two screens, if you can just chat in our two email addresses, if you have any workshop questions, I know you know my address, and I know many of you know Rebecca's address too. Please, please send out those emails. Um, we are happy to get you know get you started. And I'll I'll be honest again, we're all amongst friends. Very happy to get those emails earlier on. Um, please, please don't wait until July eighth to consider uh, what your workshop proposal might be. Madeline has also shared her email address um, and information for the Audi Awards. So. Thank you, Jeffrey. I'm, I'm seeing, you know, saying that this is really helpful. Uh, thank you to everyone who's been on the call. You know, the, the too long didn't watch of it is. We want to help. So we've got resources. We've got office hours. Send us emails, you know, carrier, pigeon carriers, whatever, you know, you want to send the, the, the like owl, you know, with the letter, I'll open my window and grab it. Do what you got to do. We want to get your questions. We want to get your information. And as you can tell by my energy, we are plumped for Summit. We are so, so excited to see you again in October and to um, just get our learning on. So thank you all so, so much for joining us. We'll send out the recording. We'll send out the office hours. You'll get a bunch of emails with relevant information. I'm expecting a bunch of emails from all of you. Let's get this Summit thing rolling, all right? Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your Monday. We will be in touch. Thank you. Bye, y'all. <laughs> Bye.